So there have been a recent trend of chiropractors online that have been uh, doing these adjustments, these Y straps, chiropractors that are doing adjustments on patients who are paralyzed. I came across a video of a chiropractor who did an adjustment on a dog who was apparently paralyzed and we're going to react to this today. What's up everyone? My name is Dr. Webb. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. You don't want to miss them. I have a very special guest today, Dr. Campbell. He's a board certified veterinarian surgeon and he's going to react to me, uh, react with me today in terms of this video that I came across. What's up, Dr. Campbell? How are you doing, man? Man, Dr. Webb, it is absolutely a delight to be joining you today and I'm definitely interested in, uh, in reacting to this video. It is a rare event that I get a chance to sort of react to a video so dramatic and as someone who specializes in orthopedic, minimally invasive surgery, uh, this, is, uh, this is really important to talk about. Absolutely, man. And, and for the viewers out there, tell them just a quickly uh, who you are and kind of what you do. Yeah, thanks for that. My, my name is Courtney Campbell. You know Dr. Campbell. I'm a board certified veterinary surgeon. I specialize in orthopedic soft tissue and minimally invasive surgery. Just so everybody knows, I think most people are familiar with kind of the process, the educational process of a human surgeon, but veterinary surgeons are very similar. We have to obviously go to four years of veterinary school, a year internship, then a surgical internship, and then a three-year residency. I actually did three years of an internship before hmm. my uh, surgical residency, there, so there is a, a, a bit of post doc training in there. I've, I've certainly been a surgeon for a while. I practice on the East Coast in Ventura, California. I live in Santa Barbara, but uh, I am certainly Connecticut born and raised. So, uh, you know, having that fusion of both East Coast and West Coast has been fun. But I think what drives me, what my passion is, is actually the connection, that, that comparative uh, medical approach, comparative anatomical and pathology approach is understanding what's happening on the human side and then how can we learn from that on the veterinary side. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said it's, uh, it's a delight to talk to you, Dr. Webb, because that is something that truly uh, uh, delights me and energizes me is those, that comparative approach. Of Absolutely. And I, I definitely agree with that 100 percent. And uh, yeah, look, looking forward to uh, kind of your thoughts about this video. I'm going to share it here and uh, let's check it out. So, Dr. Campbell, what do you see here with this uh, with, with this dog who is a little bit has some struggles in terms of their walking? What, what, what do you see here? Yeah, there's no doubt that this dog is struggling, and this is a particularly devastating condition to see a, a family member, a canine family member, going through this 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 issue. Right? We we don't know exactly from the context of the video why this dog is having difficulty walking here, but. Um, you know, everybody's kind of gathered around and they, they, they notice that he's not only just in this freeze frame here, just the, the wide base stance, the difficulty standing, um, you'll, you know, you'll see him take a few steps here in a second that, uh, you know, you can describe as significant neurologic compromise. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. Yeah, and, and when patients come in, um, humans, they, they come in with this uh, wide base gait, uh, with difficulty in their ambulation, their balance. Uh, you know, I automatically think of something in the cervical spine, like cervical myelopathy, which is a dysfunction of the, uh, the spinal cord that can lead to dysfunctions or um, abnormalities, uh, difficulty in gait. And, you know, we get an MRI to assess this cervical, thoracic, lumbar MRI. And, most of these patients, if they're walking like this, have trouble walking. Um, it could be a lot of different things, but uh, cervical myelopathy as a spine surgeon, this is probably at the top of my uh, differential. Yeah, no doubt. And I'm glad you brought that up because when I'm looking at that video, the first inclination, regardless of specialty, whether you're a neurologist or surgeon or general primary practitioner, we would describe this as ambulatory tetraparesis mm -hmm. with uh, moderate to marked general proprioceptive ataxia. And that ataxia is that drunken walk. You can also tell with this particular dog that just between her arms, he actually has a really low neck carriage. So mm. my suspicion is that this dog has significant cervical hyperesthesia or paraspinal uh, hyperesthesia, just significant neck pain, which happens to be one of the most 
the most common reports of dogs with that. But certainly uh, this dog is, is tetraparetic. Uh, we can actually see dogs who are really severe in this scenario where they have uh, a radiculopathy or nerve root impingement uh, to the front legs. And remember, a dog's not gonna tell you, hey, I'm getting shooting nerve pain going down my leg. He's just gonna limp pretty yeah. bad because he can't tell you. And then of course we can actually see in cases of respiratory compromise, because let's be clear on the human side, I would imagine Dr. Webb that they would bring this to your attention really early with a dog, either it goes unnoticed by the yeah. family or um, they, because they can't complain about it, we see some of the most severe cases. So I think you're spot on when you're looking at that is that cervical paraspinal hyper, hyperesthesia, uh, ambulatory tetraparesis mm -hmm. with uh, marked general proprioceptive ataxia. A wretch like me. She just all of a sudden collapsed. So that. My husband's like, she's having a stroke. She's not using. She's not uh, using her right side. And then an hour later, by the time I got home, she couldn't use either. So these are some imaging uh, studies here. Um, I know it may be a little bit more it may challenging to see, but what do you uh, see in these images here? Do you see anything abnormal here? You know, great question. I just want to back up one frame in that I did see that dog collapse and fall. I just want okay. to give a little bit of a side to this is that if I'm doing a neurologic exam or if I'm doing a gait exam and I'm looking at a dog, the first questions I have is, is this an orthopedic or a neurologic problem, right? Or a neurological problem. And clearly this dog is a neurological problem, but I saw him collapse and fall there. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing gait analysis and I suspect that a dog is a neurologic problem, I am with him every single step of the way. Sometimes I'll actually use a belly support because falling on your face or falling on your sternum uh, not only is uncomfortable, but it certainly can potentially cause additional extrusion of disc material. Mm -hmm. But to your question, 100%. Looking at these radiographs, it's an excellent screening tool, in my opinion, to rule out pretty nasty and dangerous things like subluxation, trauma, tumor, fungal disease, osteomyelitis, those kinds of things. Unfortunately, when you're thinking about disc extrusion, radiographs, let me repeat this because it's super important, radiographs as an accuracy tool are around 35% hmm. in just overall accuracy. Among this, among dogs who you think that there's a site of that within that cervical spine that there's a problem within that subset, it's about 60%. Mm. So when you're looking at MRI, which is about 100% accuracy, and then CT, which is around 98%, but when CT had to guess the side, which side the disc was poking out, it was around 87. Mm. So you know, in general, are there is there any utility to cervical radiographs? in the case of presumptive cervical disc disease, uh, I would say maybe. It's a great screening tool again, but if you're using it to identify a problem, then I think it's of low accuracy. The only, the only kind of signs that we'll look at on a radiograph are if the bones themselves, the vertebral mm. bodies, are a little bit closer together. So we call that intervertebral disc space narrowing. If you see that, possibly, that's one sign, but I would not rely on radiographs. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, if a patient comes in with a cervical radiculopathy, which is a uh, shooting pain down the arm, from yes. pres you know presumptive uh, cervical disc herniation or you know stenosis, which can cause lead to myelopathy, uh, we usually start off with uh, X-rays of the cervical spine. We get flexion, okay. extension X-rays, AP lateral, so four views of the cervical spine to see if. Like you mentioned, if there's collapse of the, uh, the disc space or if there's a slippage of the vertebrae, like a spondylolisthesis, any scoliosis, any tumors, osteomyelitis, infection, some of those things you can pick up. But with better diagnostic um, accuracy, the MRI is kind of what I usually get if I'm really concerned about something. Uh, one, one quick question, Dr. Webb, too, is one, in, in addition to the intervertebral disc space narrowing that we kind of identify as being one of the signs of having potentially a disc extrusion or protrusion, one sign also that helped was the vacuum phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Are you also noticing that in, in, in radiographs on your patients as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we look for those things to uh, see what could... Um, you know, what could the patient be possibly pre presenting with? But in my training, we've always been taught that your history is most important. So if a patient comes in 
neck pain started after maybe they were lifting something or it just even kind of gradually came on, it shoots down to their arm, to their thumb. I know that's a C6 level, so five, six. They, there's a, probably a disc herniation at the right five, six. So most of what I do is based off of history. And then I confirm that with the imaging studies with a uh, more advanced imaging studies like an MRI. That's, this is why it's so fascinating to talk to you, Dr. Webb. Thank you for that. Because for me, we rely on reflexes. Because mm. as you can imagine, we don't get that history, right? Yeah. We, not to be glib, but a lot of our dogs aren't coming in telling us, hey, you know, my neck started hurting after I lifted <laughs> something. So what we have to do is when we're doing that gait analysis is I follow that immediately with reflexive tests. And, yep. and uh, reflexes in the thoracic limbs or in the front arms, mm. they're not terribly reliable, but we, we still go through those motions because we think it's important to help localize our lesion. And then we use our reflexes and neuroanatomic localization of that lesion and compare that with our imaging. So yeah, that's we. there's so many similarities, but one big difference is the lack, the lack of history. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Was but now I see amazing grace, how sweet the so it, it looks like uh, they took the dog to a chiropractor and I just wanted to get your thoughts. Um, you know, for most patients that come to see me, they're, they're going down the conservative route, either that's physical therapy, some type of chiropractor to do some type of therapy to, to help strengthen the muscles, help alleviate some of the pain. Um, mm -hmm. Do you commonly refer um, your patients, uh, do you refer to your animals as patients, correct? Yeah, for okay. sure. Patients, okay. are, patients are the dogs and cats, and then, of course, yeah. the clients are the family. You know? Gotcha. And then, do you commonly refer to physical therapy or chiropractic? Is, is that such a thing in the veterinarian world? Well, for sure. A okay. big shout out to canine, certified canine rehabilitation specialists, or CCRTs. Hmm. I'm a huge fan of them. Uh, and, you know, physical therapy can be done to uh, a modest degree at home or what I call informal physical therapy, but by far the biggest and most impactful benefits that you'll see from physical therapy are going to be from a certified canine rehabilitation mm. specialist and just look for that CCRT after their name. Mm. But uh, let, let me be clear about sort of chiropractic manipulation, you know, in, in this case. There is uh, a paucity of studies in veterinary medicine that actually look at chiropractic adjustment in, in, in species in general, particularly in the clinical setting. There's some basic studies that have been done on chiropractic manipulation, specifically in feline, ovine, and porcine, or cat, sheep, and, and pigs. But those are basic studies. In the clinical scenario, only horses and a few studies on dogs, but when they looked at a meta-analysis, meta these studies, you know, they didn't have standardization. They were of mm -hmm. low power. Uh, they didn't have blinding. They were subjected to some bias. So they're, you know, looking to see if there's evidence of manipulation or, or joint manipulation in the canine species that's just not there. And that mm -hmm. one study they, that had the most power was actually a study on the wrist or the carpus, looking at range of motion, not the vertebral spine. So in this scenario, uh, I just don't see the evidence for it. But let me, let me, be, let me go one step further. I mean, the World Health Organization, or WHO, finds that acute spinal trauma or neurologic compromise that is progressive to be one of the contraindications for chiropractic adjustment or spinal manipulation. So when he's pushing on that spine in that scenario, combined with that sharp motion that he's mm -hmm. making in dorsiflexion of that cervical spine, that's, to me, concerning only because I don't know of evidence to support that and it could potentially cause further disc extrusion now if there's a study that i'm not privy to or there's new exciting research that's just come out that says hey chiropractic adjustment in the face of presumptive cervical disc disease is the thing to do and it's going to improve then by all means but uh in this scenario from this video with the context that i have here i certainly have some concerns yeah, and that's the same concerns I had with chiropractors that were doing these really forceful adjustments, pulling patients' heads, 
with the with the Y strap kind of pulling around their head, putting it around their head and pulling really forcefully. There's no really evidence behind that, and, um, and it, th those were my concerns what I expressed on previous videos. But Daisy, look. Come get this. Daisy, look. I think that's a little better already. I want to see her again. Go fix her. She's not going to need surgery. Good girl. Look at that. We were going to have her put down. And uh, because she couldn't walk, she was paralyzed. She was a dead dog. We tried for two weeks to get something for her. Dr. Naputi says bring her in. So that's what we did. Dr. Kemba, what are your thoughts on that? She mentioned that she was, uh, the dog was paralyzed. When, when, when we think about that in humans, someone who's paralyzed, you know, I've seen a patient recently in the ER and she couldn't move her arms or legs and definitely couldn't place any weight. Is that a, um, was that an incorrect statement and she said the, par the dog was paralyzed or is the patient just have, the dog just have weakness? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say that was accurate, right? Mm -hmm. But from what I'm seeing on the video, I'm seeing a dog who has severe tetraparesis. And just for everybody mm -hmm. out there, when I'm talking about tetraparesis, what I'm basically saying is that all four limbs are affected, mm -hmm. but you can still move them with coordinated function, meaning you can still move them. Now, if you may have an inability to walk, we call that non-ambulatory tetraparesis. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can walk like this dog, I call that ambulatory tetraparesis, but tetraplegia, or where a dog comes in laterally on his side and he can't move it, or he or she can't move anything, mm -hmm. that means to me, okay, this dog has tetraplegia, uh, and that is relatively uncommon. I would say any dog who comes into the hospital who has a suspected disc issue, 25% of the time, it is a cervical issue. 25% of the time, it is cervical issue. Now, you can see in this dog here, he's still what I call making mistakes, meaning stumbling. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a sort of a, a catch-all term I use for dogs who are still able to walk, but stumble or missteps or those sorts of things. He said he's looking better. Uh, he won't need surgery. Uh, and then five months later, looks like that dog from all indications that he's pretty comfortable. So she mm -hmm. said that she was thinking of putting him down. Mm -hmm. Everybody who is listening, right? Anybody who has a dog who has this issue, it's a devastating condition. But I would say in general, definitely don't turn to euthanasia immediately unless you're you know, talking to your veterinarian because that guy, you know, although I'm not sure if he's a veterinarian or not, he said he won't need surgery, you know, to about 50% of the time, he's gonna be right. What we found with medical management of cervical disc disease is that about 49 or 50% of the time, these cases will resolve with medical management. Now, what do we mean by medical management? You know, cage rest, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, those sorts of things. There was a, approximately an 18% failure rate, treatment failure rate, meaning 18% of those dogs where you elected to do medical management, yep actually ended up needing uh, surgery or, or euthanasia. So uh, listen, if you're out there, this is a devastating disease and your dog has tetraparesis and cervical pain, uh, please understand there are, um, there are, there is help for your dog and, and medical management could be a pathway for your dog. Yep, and it's very similar for my patients. Uh, you know, most of our studies show between 80 to 90 percent of patients who present with the cervical radiculopathy is going to improve with uh, conservative measures, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. Uh, sometimes I'll give them a medrol dose pack, which is a couple days of oral steroids. So uh, most of it does get better with time. But Dr. Campbell, I, I definitely appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing your uh, expertise and your, your advice. Um, how can people reach out to you or if they uh, wanted to see you as, uh, you know, they have animals, they want to see you for, you know, for veterinarian needs. How can people get a hold of you? Listen, I'll be honest with you. I hope your dog never does need surgery. But if you do <laughs> have questions, comments, or if your dog does need surgery, don't hesitate to reach out to me at Dr. Courtney BBM on socials, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, of course, and uh, of course, YouTube. And then, of course, www.drcourtneydvm, like drveterinarymedicine.com, drcourtneydvm.com. Don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to 
chat, chat with you and, and hopefully uh, keep families together. Because literally that's how I look at it. Canine family members, we're just keeping families together.